Hello my dear friends, welcome back to the channel Perfume Guru and today we have a very interesting video. Uh, we are talking to one of my favorite natural perfumers who is Dr. Tion Rheinthal from Australia. She is a very talented artist who works with natural perfume materials and um, I was uh, very happy to test her perfumes. I got Ziba, Sacred, uh, Night Song and these three are some of my favorites from her house. And I just thought I'll ask her to make a video on how the whole process is, you know, how she decides, um, how she creates, how she chooses materials and all that um, stuff which goes into the making of natural perfume. So guys, I hope you enjoy this video and a big, big thanks to Dr. Uh, Tion Reinthal because she has put in a lot of effort to give us this video and it's a very precious piece of audiovisual information. I hope you have fun with this one guys and yes, uh, please check out her website because she is a fabulous creator and I think uh, you've got to try some of her perfumes, especially the ones uh, uh, like Ziba and Night Song. Very special, uh, you get the taste, you get the taste of most exact uh, most exotic natural materials from her sense uh, which is a true gift in all you know all in all aspects as far as perfumery is concerned in today's world so yes enjoy the video guys i'm tion from tion rantal natural perfume and um, a long time ago maybe 20 something years ago i studied aromatherapy i did a diploma in clinical aromatherapy and i loved it it was a beautiful um, gentle way of working um, therapeutically with a whole range of issues and I focused mostly on emotional kinds of distresses and, and difficulties that people were having. I started to really deeply explore the possibility of making the kinds of perfumes that I really wanted to have using natural ingredients and it was never actually about um, you know, the toxicity or the assumed toxicity or the, you know, the kind of the scare stuff that goes on about synthetic perfume. I just wanted lots of perfume and I knew how to blend essential oils. And so I decided that it would be fantastic to, um, to create my own wardrobe. It was never a commercial venture. It was purely for selfish reasons. I wanted a stupendous perfume collection I knew how to blend essential oils and I set out to recreate some of the wonders, you know. I wanted all of Dior, I wanted all of Chanel, all of Jean Pateau. I wanted to have them all sitting in my wardrobe in the quantities that would last me till the end of time um, made by me. You asked me what perfume is or to describe what perfume is. Um, and there's probably um, an infinite number of answers to that question. But there are two answers that spring to my mind. One is that the first answer is that I believe perfume is a territorial marker. It's the presence, it's, it's, it's the, the plant or the animal signaling out to its own species that there's a fertile opportunity here for procreation, come get me. And human beings um, aren't satisfied, we're not satisfied with our own organic inherent human perfume. So we um, have reached out and harvested the scents because they're very pleasing of, well, mostly they're very pleasing of, of plants and particularly very aromatic plants and flowers. And we've even scraped the glands of poor critters to, um, to beef up the, um, the signal that we wanted to send out to each other that, you know, baby come get me. But um, that's not done very much anymore. Well, it's done somewhere and in some form, but generally it's, um, it's a synthetic thing. I don't ever put animal parts in my perfume. It, from my point of view, there's no need to. The plants have got the whole game covered. Um, and it's up to the perfumer to actually really push the boundaries of those substances, those foul-smelling, pungent, 
wicked smells that plants exude and to incorporate that that message into a perfume. It needs to be a letter, a beautiful love letter. The second definition, my definition of what a perfume is, is it's not enough to just throw a bunch of sweet smelling um, chemicals into a flask and swirl them around and say that's perfume, that's not perfume. Perfume is greater than the sum of its parts. It's a statement. It's something that mysteriously and wondrously comes together and just breathes. And it, it tells a new story. It's no longer about, oh, well, that's lavender and that's ambergris and that's, you know, vanilla. It's never that. It's when the components meet each other head on in a battle within the flask and some kind of an opera takes place. There's a new animal that emerges and that's perfume. The most um, surprising and incredible um, method of making a perfume is simply about noticing the raw ingredients in such detail that you're that I'm able to select very few ingredients and match them in exactly the right quantities where the ingredients the the, the few ingredients used in that particular combination absolutely match each other in the intensity um, and the complexity of their own essence so that the sum of three or four parts just leaps out of the flask. It's, it suddenly becomes um, long lasting, incredibly radiant. It projects very far and there's a luminosity to it that is just breathtaking. That's the best kind of method of making a perfume is purely about noticing um, that that vetiver, that batch of vetiver is just absolutely meant for that batch of pale green bergamot that's arrived, that they are just perfect bedfellows. And into that mix, you know, the orange blossom that you've been hiding under the cupboard for the last two years is, you know, it's just the perfect bridge between the two. And then you've got this simple, elegant, efficiency in a perfume. It just works. It just bang, comes together. That's number one. Number two is what I call um, waste not, want not. Um, I've made many perfumes that just didn't work. And what I've learned, I used to paint a lot and um, I learned pretty early on that a successful painting is um, one in which the artist has persevered past the troubles, past the limits, past their problems. And often it requires a lot of bold hurling of um, oil um, paints at the canvas until you achieve the right density and the right texture and the right um, uh, kind of spine. And the same is true of those kinds of perfumes that don't easily click together. They are if it's not great, it's not finished. Now, the third thing that I want to say about my process of making perfume is um, even more abstract and strange because I think of a perfume composition as a three-dimensional, say, a cube. Imagine um, an aquarium, a fish tank with all kinds of tropical fish swimming in it. Some of the fish swim up close to the pane of glass that's, you know, closest to you. Some are darting around in the back. Some are lazily kind of skimming around the bottom at the gravel and some are up the top swimming around. And there's constant motion and flow. So when I'm composing a perfume, I think of it in terms of that three dimensionality and I want to explore 
where to place those ingredients. Do I put the sandalwood at the back and in the lower corner, in the left corner? Do I bring it further forward and move it into the midsection? Um, do I support that with some, um, by um, amplifying some of the woodier notes of the sandalwood, or do I extend the creaminess by introducing certain florals that really feature, you know, that, that kind of click together with that? So it's a three dimensional cube or a, a shape. Um, things need to be placed spatially. Spatially is really important. Because I don't use synthetic um, ingredients, I've had to solve the problem of um, creating lift and airiness and, and um, oxygenating a perfume so that it's not just completely wall-to-wall -wall dense, you know, components. And my way around that has to do a lot of work with tincturing ingredients. And luckily where we live, we've, we've planted um, uh, Morea paniculata, which is mock orange or orange jessamine. And it's just amazingly grown into this enormous tree that gives us kilograms of that flower every year, several times. So we harvest that and but then I, I've been able to discover that tincturing that particular flower is um, a fantastic resource to a natural perfumer's palate because it provides this, this kind of opacity, this beautiful, um, um, it's, it's, it's all the bubbles, it's all the froth, and yet it's not so dominant that you can really detect it. But if it's not there, the perfume sinks. And with it, it's just really effervescent. Um, I tincture vanilla beans, um, cocoa beans, frangipani. Some friends of ours have a marvellous Lang Lang tree and Tony and, and Dee's Lang Lang tree is what makes Blue Lotus so beautiful. Um, and yeah, other things, cocoa, vanilla, oh, tonka beans from um, South America, from Venezuela. Um, all of those things are a wonderful addition to a natural perfumer's palette because, as I said before, they're not dominating notes, but they're really essential notes to kind of give a perfume dimension. How do I convince friends or strangers to try natural perfume? That's a hilarious question because um, a couple of days ago I was meeting with a, a friend at, um, at a restaurant and I took some samples for him in little you know, glass bottles and when he arrived I was handing them to him and I dropped one of them and it broke. <laughs> and the woman that owned the restaurant came running over and was like, what's that smell? And where can I get that? And my friend said, oh, yeah, it's an amazing smell. So we kind of managed to get a little bit of what had spilled onto a napkin so he could keep it as a, a reference to take home. And in the meantime, that woman kept chasing me around saying, can I have your card? Do you sell this? You know, where did you get this? And, and, and that's the most common thing. You know, people at supermarket checkouts and everywhere I go and say, what is that perfume? Where can I get that? My favourite ingredients are things like really beautifully dry, rusty patchouli. That kind of metallic, earthy, sharp, that turns into sweet smell of patchouli. Mice or sandalwood. I'm only just really grappling with entry-level oud. The stuff that I've used in several of my perfumes, I've used in vast quantities because I love it. But it's a, um, it's a Vietnamese oud that's cultivated. It's, it's not wild because I can't afford to buy it in the quantities 
that I'm using in my perfumes. Talamaya, Kodama and Ziba all have very large quantities of Vietnamese oud and it's beautiful. It smells like a cross between um, single malt whiskey, aged single malt whiskey and leather. It's a fantastic um, villain in my beautiful rose sandalwood perfume um, Ziba. Um, in Talamaya, it's absolutely, you know, the the most potent form of, of wild earth magic you can find in the deep Scandinavian forests. And in Kodama, it's just this really elegant um, depth of um, of Japanese culture in that subtlety of, of elegance and power and, and beauty. The understated potency of Kodama comes from, again, the Vietnamese oud. But it's, it's a new ingredient to me. I haven't grown up with it. It's certainly a very um, addictive thing to be around. I have had a little bit of Brunei oud given to me and some Hindi or some Indian oud, which um, I've played around with and made a couple of things with too. But of course, all of the flowers. Um, I think anything that smells like the garden is my favourite ingredient. What's unique about my perfumes, and the thing that I feel probably most um, satisfied with, is that I set out to make perfume. I didn't set out to make remedies or aromatherapies or kind of hippie stuff. I said I, I wanted to have classic French perfume before all of the, the you know, the IFRA kind of um, the regulations and the restrictions and be, before all of the kind of economic decisions made in the, the boardrooms about how much more profit we can make if we, you know, replicate or duplicate or, you know, um, replace real oak moss with, you know, all of the synthetic stuff that all, of, you know, fr from vanilla through to every other beautiful thing that's grown in the, gr in the ground now becoming something that's created in a lab. So I wanted to run back in time, time travel back to before that happened and make perfume that could somehow one day make it into the parlours and the, the courts of royalty and the places where love affairs were happening and the places where beautiful music was being listened to. You know, those moments of stillness, those moments of grandeur and those moments of intimacy that um, I think are really enhanced by real perfume.